good morning. My name is Chrissy Ziegler, and today I'm going to be switching gears a little bit from the last talk that you heard, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the considerations that we, um, the important considerations on the effects of radiation for designing and operating a fuel uh, re reprocessing facility. Um, normally, uh, Bob Sindelar would give this talk. He regrets that he cannot be here. And probably after I finish this talk, you will regret that Bob was not here. So, but he is back at Savannah River site uh, visiting with the Defense Board. So, um, he definitely sends his apologies. Uh, here is. Um, this is a, um, I'm going to be talking about the three areas of the effects of radiation for the design and operation of a fuel reprocessing facility. Um, I'm going to, right here, you see a picture of our, our canyon, and he told me that was going to happen, and I didn't uh, believe him. But um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the radioisotopes considered in spent fuel. Um, you've heard about that for the past two days, so we'll kind of quickly glance over it. Um, then I'm going to go in and talk to the three areas for consideration, which are shielding for personnel, which is radiolysis and the effects that they have on the processing solutions and the materials. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the radiation effects um, on the actual structural materials. Um, as I said, this is a picture of our canyon. We have a lot of operating experience with, um, with uh, 60 years of experience of materials performance at the site. This is a picture of the canyon, and you're looking at the, at the north wall. And um, from the right-hand side, you get the cold chemicals coming in. Um, they're brought in through the, through the embedded piping on the right. And then you see on the left-hand side, that's the hot wall for which the processed liquids are transferred through embedded piping. Um, as you, you saw this picture, I think it was on Tuesday, I can't remember, but as you see, there's a lot of piping, and if all the cell covers were removed, you'd actually see the tanks of where all this um, processed material is coming from. Okay, to start off, to discuss actually the source term of the radioisotopes and the spent fuel, we're going to consider a research reactor fuel and the isotopes following the operation of that and the discharge. Um, at the Savannah River site, we have an inventory of over 11,000 materials test reactor design, and that is um, what that, oh, it's not up there, sorry, I thought it was up there. Um, and this is an assembly of a total of 15 to 19 fuel plates. Um, they're each approximately two and a half inches wide by about two and a half feet long, and they're about 50 mils thick. The cladding is also about 15 mils thick, and the core is about 20 mils thick. The cladding is nearly pure aluminum alloy, and the fuel core is in a uranium aluminum alloy. Um, as we know, what happens is the uranium fissions leading to a suite of fission products, but we also get the absorption of neutrons, which is going to lead to a suite of actinides. Um, the radioisotopes produced, we can have alpha emitters, beta emitters, gamma emitters, and we can also have spontaneous neutron emitters. Um, another source of neutrons is from secondary reactions from the alpha neutron reactions. And those are considered like the amber, amaryllium beryllium sources or the plutonium beryllium sources, which are engineered as true neutron sources. Right now, we can calculate the inventory of specific radioisotopes in the um, fuel, and this right here, we're going to consider one of those MTR um, design fuel assemblies that was irradiated in the HFR Penton reactor, which is um, located near the Netherlands. We can calculate this, um, the radioisotopes generated, either by building a model. We can do an assembly average model, a core average model, or a 3D location specific model. Um, for the MTR case, we're going to consider assembly average model. This fuel was irradiated at uh, 211 megawatt days. Um, that corresponded to about 58% burn up, which is that 58% of the uranium 235 species was um, in the original assembly was fissioned. Um, we can get an inventory of the fission products and the actinites that were created. As you see the chart on the right hand side, each group decays over time. And we see, well, not in this case, but over after about a year of cool down, we're down approximately three orders of magnitude in the overall carrier activity content for the fuel that's dominated by the fission products. Um, also, as a side note, you know, as the longer lit, at several hundred years cool down, as we saw the other day, the actinides are the dominant species. This sh slide shows the specific um, radioisotopes for that Penton react for the Penton assembly. Um, this particular um, 
Isotopic analysis was created using the origin S code, which is a simulation tool um, that computed the actinide and the Curie content. Um, this was after 209 days of cooldown. This was the last point on that previous slide. M4 impact and shielding on the processing systems, you know, you want to consider your highest activity. Um, a listing could be developed for various isotopes that would remain for long-term storage or that would remain even for repository disposal. Um, right here, what we're seeing is the radioisotope content, only the actinides only for greater than 10 to the minus 4 Curie content and the fission for 10 to the minus 2 Curie content, greater than 10 to the, sorry, 10 to the second Curie content. But there's, there's others as well. Um, we can also, you know, as the listing of activity is going to change with different time and with different isotopes, so we can design our, uh, we can run our codes to find out the species that would remain for after separation processes, after dry storage processes, or even re repository disposal. Okay, let's, now we're going to get into shielding. Um, we all are, we all should be able to design simple shielding systems based on our knowledge of alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron um, radiation. Um, I'm not going to really go over this, just to, but just to point out that gamma and neutron uh, radiations, we have to have um, other considerations in their shielding designs due to their long range in the air in an unshielded system. Whoops, sorry. Trigger happy, sorry. Um, we're going to use gamma radiation to discuss the concepts of shielding. Um, gamma, gamma interacts with matter, and it can, it can be attenuated. So either it can be scattered or can it be absorbed in three principal modes. At low energies, we have the photoelectric effect, where a photon impacts and you get, or sorry, it, a photon imparts energy and the electron is shot out. Um, at immediate, immediate gamma energies, you get Compton scattering, and that's going to produce a gamma at a lower energy in a Compton electron. And then at higher uh, thresholds, greater than 1 MeV, we can get this, um, the gamma pair production, which the gamma ray is annihilated, and then you get this electron-positron uh, creation. Now, immediately following that, the positron is annihilated, and it results in the formation of two gammas. Um, this figure right here shows the attenuation coefficient for lead, which is normalized by its density for each of these interactions. The attenuation, which if you remember, is the scattering absorption, um, shows as the, the incident gamma ray passes through the material. In this case, the incident gamma flux would be reduced by its attenuation coefficient. Um, it's, interesting, it's interesting to note that the energy deposited in a material primarily occurs via interactions to produce electrons, which slow down in the actual absorber material. Okay, now to go to talk about shielding, again, with um, exposure rate for flux out of an, uh, an initial energy. This is when we have an emergent gamma flux is absorbed in a mass of air. So let's say this point over on the right-hand side. Now, in the case of no shielding or no attenuation of the flux of gammas, the exposure rate is going to be correlatable to the flux of gammas, the incident energy, as well as the mass absorption coefficient for air. Now, with a shield, you get this buildup flux results, and you have the construction of a buildup flux. And we have that that buildup flux is made to enable simple engineering calcs. Uh, for the exposure rate in our volume of air after the gamma has been altered in its spectrum by passing through that shield. Um, this does provide a database of um, various atten attenuation and absorption coefficients for a wide range of high to low to high Z materials compounds. Now, with this buildup flux, this, the Got to watch what I say. The uh, figures on the right show the concept of the alteration of that initial gamma energy um, spectrum after it passes through the shield material. That top shows the incident energy. The bottom one shows that although the incident energy peak has been reduced, we have this buildup of flux right here. And that's a lower energy gamma is built up. Now, the, the buildup factor that we have to take into consideration um, correlates the attenuated flux 
to the integrated flux, including the flux at the lower energies. Um, you can look up these uh, calc you can look up these in tables and text and use it in the following in all these formulas to calculate what that buildup flux is. Now, if we it would be very easy to com compute a flux if every time the photon interacted with matter it just disappeared, but it doesn't do that, so we have to take these um, flux these gammas into consideration. Now, neutron shielding is a little bit different. Um, it's similar, except that the primary interactions of the neutrons are with the atoms of the shield material. Um, the complexities arise due to the creation of a gamma flux from the scattering reactions with the nuclei, as well as from neutron capture reactions. And another thing that you need to consider is the isotope of the shield um, for neutron capture reactions. Now, we can use those formulas on the prior page to calculate what our buildup flux is, but for higher accuracy, we want to move on to transport theory or Monte Carlo methods. Um, these are typically for the tabulation of factors for particle energy and shield geometries that uh, for flux buildup. Because they're limited in that previous formula, we have to go to these. Um, the primary tool of analysis when we want to sharpen our pencils to the greatest extent is the Monte Carlo method and the um, Monte, Car Monte, Monte Carlo and the particle code is the tool of choice for these applications. But um, just a reminder um, that all of the Canyon facilities were not built on the Monte Carlo methods. They were built on those simple calculations that we saw up front. Some units to characterize the amount of radioactivity. Um, you've all seen these uh, before, but some what you'll see is the Curies, um, and that represents the total radio. It, it's total or it's radionuclide specific, as well as the Becquerel. Um, the decays per minute per milliliter are used to characterize solutions, um, and you can also find that in Becquerel per mils. For exposure dose and dose equivalent units, um, they're, they're defined in this table. The Rankin is the unit of exposure uh, that relates to charge production in air. It's rarely used as a practical parameter. Um, dose is the energy absorbed in a unit mass. In DOE, we use the RAD that's equivalent to one joule per kilogram um, to express a radiation dose. Um, the standard international unit is the gray, and that is equ equivalent to 100 RADs. Um, when we when we want to take the dose equivalent, the last one here is a unit that includes a factor to weight the energy disposition concentration effects in, and that is the REM. Um, basically, when you have different radiations and different types of energies, that's when you use um, this. And this the SI unit for that is a sievert, and one sievert is equal to 100 REM. And I, I believe that bottom equation should be one microsievert equals one millirem, not gray and millirem, so sorry about that. <clears throat> Next, we're going to move on to radiolysis. Radiolysis of the material is characterized as the production of compounds due to its incident radiation. Uh, the conventional parameter used is the G value, which is the number of molecules um, produced or destroyed uh, per 100 EV of absorbed energy, and the products that is, are created are very, very dependent upon the incident radiation. Um, we're going to look qualitatively at the production of uh, free radicals and stable compounds um, from the radiation interaction as energy is transferred to the system. Um, a typical example here is uh, water, and we see water, when incident radiation hits it, it breaks apart into a bunch of different components. These are the overall chemical um, action of radiation in water that you can find. Um, you also can get back reactions when you have the hydroxide or reverse reactions when you have free hydroxide and hydrogen radicals and they're interacting with other species and they create water again. Um, a strong forward reaction to produce new compounds occurs when the molecular yield is greater than the radical yield, and the observed G value for a system is a net result of all of these reactions. Um, for water, 
the G value is actually 4.5 by gamma rays, that is. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the effects of radiolysis and separation chemistry systems. Um, the first two we're going to deal with the uh, aqueous um, process solutions, and then the third is going to talk about the exchange materials for these systems. Um, as we heard Monday or Tuesday and Wednesday, a lot about TBB and its, in its use in the Purex and the HM processes. Um, chemical and radiological, radiological reactions do radiolytic, sorry, reactions do decompose the, the TPB. And the breakdown sequence for TPB, as we heard, also goes from, goes from the tributyl, triambutyl to the dibutyl phosphoric acid to the monobutyl phosphoric acid and then to phosphoric acid. Some of the various um, degradation products that are produced are, are those as well as hydrogen, methane, ethane, various hydrocarbons, and even polymers are created from this um, degradation. Um, also, addition of nitric acid to the, to, to the TBP solution does introduce many thermal, action, thermal reactions as well. Uh, you heard ferrous sulfamamate is used to reduce the neptunium-4 to the neptun or neptunium-5 to neptunium-4 and the plutonium-4 to 3 for separation. Um, and what the iron is used for to, to uh, protect that, those forms from the OH radical. Sulfamamate is added to prevent the nitrate oxidation of the iron-2. And um, when you get interaction with uh, radiation, they decompose both that iron and the, sulfam the sulfamate. Radiation effects on ion exchange materials, various resins are used in systems, as we heard. Um, you can, when radiation, the effects of this are loss of exchange capacity with those resins, as well as possible gas evolution. <coughs> The radiolysis of um, TPB is very dependent on the solution that it's in. Um, however, in all systems, the, the, uh, the, dib the dibutyl phosphoric acid is the primary, primary radiolytic, radi geez, I can't say that word, radiolytic compound. Um, this ch chapter on radiolytic behavior, it provides a very, very good um, analysis of all of this radiosis effects observed on TPB in various solutions. This particular um, graph was taken out of that and it shows that we see greater yield of total acid or HDP in anhydrous TPB than we do in a water saturated uh, TPB. What this is is TPB in various aliphatic solutions including like isooctane, we have um, butanol, dodecane, and basically, as we see, the dissolved water reduces the acid yields in the radiolysis. Um, the open circles on here represent the dry uh, TBP, and the closed cir circles represent the water saturated. And as you see, the water saturated, all the, as the TBP concentration increases, the total acid produces a little bit lower than the, um, the ones up with the dry TBP. TPB breakdown can occur through several mechanisms. Um, this includes hydrolysis as well as radiolysis. Um, this, as you, this chart basically shows the TPD, TBP degradation rates due to acid hydrolysis, alpha radiolysis, and metal ion induced hydrolysis at 80 degrees C. And what this shows is the grams of plutonium that are complexed with the degradation product with the degradation products over time. And the metal induced um, hydrolysis does have a um, larger effect on the TBB, TBP degradation. And it is it is very, very strongly dependent. Um, the hydrolysis, chemical hydrolysis as well as the radiolysis is very um, temperature dependent. Another important process solution that is subject to breakdown is FSA. Um, and as we said earlier, um, I, uh, not FSA, FESA. Um, it acts to reduce and maintain neptunium, plutonium in their reduced ionic states. Um, this, it can be broken down by the radiolytic oxidation of iron. And as we see in that first chart, when its concentration falls to zero, there's a rapid reversion of the neptunium and the plutonium 
charged states, as shown in, in the bottom figure, um, if, it's, if iron's not present, we see quick reversion, um, and high dose rates in the process solution cause that rapid depletion. Now, Ned Bibbler from SRNL um, did a solid investigation on actual process solutions with its attendant radiation and in simulation testing to demonstrate the utility of using ir irradiators to investigate radiolysis effects. And that's actually what this slide shows. In conjunction with the process, actual process solutions that we saw in the previous slide, um, this slide demonstrates that you can use cobalt-60 irradiation to um, show the effects of the fission products as well. Um, this testing was in our cobalt irradi irradiator, and although it's several times the dose rate of the solution, um, it is several times the dose rate of the solution with the fission products in the previous slide. But once again, it shows as time, as time goes on, the, con the concentration of iron is depleted with dose. Radiolysis effects um, has been an empirical science uh, for these process solutions and um, for the exchange material. Um, the effects of the dose or the energy deposition are reported in terms of generation of breakdown products and has uh, guided the operations of separations systems. Um, what this shows right here is doses of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th gray do significantly um, reduce the uh, integrity of the of an organic ion exchanger and what an organic resin is basically a high molecular weight polyacid or base that's virtually insoluble in aqueous and non-aqueous materials. 